Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. Is a quote from Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States of America, the country's leader during the Civil War. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our discussion today on the 2020 US presidential election, a country divided after what just transpired, yearning to move forward. Our guest today is US politics and history expert, Stephen Loosely AM, who served as Senator for New South Wales in the Australian Parliament during the Hawke and Keating governments, where he chaired both the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, and the Senate Regulations Committee. Hello and welcome to a special episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner at Blendham Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. As noted in our first discussion, we now continue the conversation with Stephen after the election to review the key moments, how events unfolded, what the future of America will look like, and the ramifications for the world. In the spirit of democratic political discourse, to provide balance in a conversation with the support of the Democratic Party, I will be providing commentary in opposition, presenting a Republican or pro-Trump stance. Please note that the views and opinions expressed by Stephen Loosely in this podcast are his own, and do not necessarily reflect those of the organizations he is involved with. So sit back and enjoy the second part of The Battle for the Soul of America. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure to be back with you. U.S. elections certainly been interesting. Well, no question about that. I mean, it's in the American tradition of uh, hotly contested elections during the campaign at the ballot and subsequent to the ballot. So what's your current thoughts on the, the play of the election? Joseph Robin Ed Biden Jr. is going to be the 46th president of the United States. Kamala Harris will be his vice president and they will be sworn in on the 20th of January. I think it's a, it's a clear win and no matter how much static is in the background generated out of the Trump White House, that will be the result. Where was it won? It was won in a number of places and not necessarily during the campaign. I think a lot of Americans had made up their minds well before uh, election day. COVID-19 undoubtedly hurt the president's campaign, not by as much as some people suspect, but it undoubtedly hurt his campaign because the American uh, uh, response was nothing short of chaotic with uh, different rules and different approaches in the different states and cities and the, uh, the like. So that hurt. Absent COVID-19, I think it would have been an entirely different campaign and Donald Trump may well have won a second term. Mm -hmm. But I think people were making up their uh, minds during the onset of the pandemic, looking at the shambolic response, looking at the arguments inside the administration where the president was critical of people around him, including Dr. Fauci and so on and, and so forth, and seeing the pandemic really get out of control. Mm -hmm. So I think that hit hard. A number of uh, Americans, Americans have been very committed and very deliberate in their voting in, in this election. A number of Americans, in terms of registering their disapproval of Donald Trump, were just tired of the endless chaos out of the, the White House and turned off 
by the tweeting, which uh, Trump had used to good effect to rally his base, but had uh, little positive impact amongst independents. 77 million people voted for Joe Biden thus far before the counts, and what, 72 million for Donald Trump? Numbers haven't finished been counting yet, Stephen. But there's so much has been counted, it's safe to say that the result is clear. 70% of the Americans don't believe the election was free and fair. Where does that figure originate? Counts. That doesn't gel with anything I've seen. It comes from Politico. I thought well, I'd raise that for you. I know you're going to have an angle, and I'll just put some headlines there. 70% there away. of Americans don't believe the election was free and fair? Yep, supposedly to that poll. But there's the other question. Who trusts the polls? Well, let's just, completely wrong, let's just uh, roll it back for a moment and, uh, and focus on realities. The circumstances of the polls that I've seen show that about 80% of Americans do accept the, uh, 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 the result. Which poll was that? The I, saw, I heard circumstances, that one too. The circumstances of the recounts in American political history. Yep. And look, in the Trump universe, this won't mean anything because it's fact, but circumstances have been that alterations in voting outcomes as a consequence of recounts mm -hmm. are generally of the order of 0 0.0002%. Yep. Tiny. Yeah, they are. You have some situations where a couple of hundred votes change. Sometimes the winner goes further ahead, by the way. You might have a couple of thousand that have been mislaid. I have seen this in Australian elections, but it's very rare that a recount changes the result. And we'll see that in Georgia when the hand counting is finished. There's 14,000 gap difference, isn't there? When the hand counting is finished, we will see the result is confirmed. Well, I saw a number this morning. 79% of all counties in the United States, 79% voted for Trump, voted for the Republicans. Yes, and it's, it's probably possible to walk from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific seaboard right through Republican counties. So, so, it's, so it's the major, so it's the cities which Trump don't vote, isn't it? won the election. So it's the cities which vote for the Democrats. In the main, in the main. But in the state of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Biden had uh, uh, some very good advice early on from local campaigners. Mm -hmm. What Hillary Clinton had missed in 2016 was she'd concentrated early on on Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. They're Democratic strongholds in the main. And the, the results were there, but not of the same dimension as for Barack Obama. What the locals in Pennsylvania told the former vice president, as he then was, campaign out in the counties, out in rural and regional areas. You want to win Scranton, and he did, by the way. Yeah, he did, he yeah. did win Scranton. You want to win Scranton and other small towns and the, uh, uh, the like run in the uh, in the counties well outside the major cities. It does two things. One, it depresses your opponent's vote, and two, it increases yours. And in a state like Pennsylvania, that told. Yeah, but on the um, election day or election evening, if I remember rightly, uh, in Pennsylvania, Stephen, Trump was up 600,000 votes, and the next day it started to change. It was a red mirage. Well, what is, well... It was a really? red mirage. The way things are going with the, the Trumpeteering flock, they'll be at Jonestown, Guyana, drinking the Kool-Aid. I mean, my God. What's his path to victory? He's got a path to victory. Potential. Sorry, who has a path to victory? Trump. There is none. 100% no Trump at all. There no, is no none. chance at all. It's over. It's over. There's one in five chances, isn't there? It's over. What happens in Pennsylvania? Let's talk, Pennsylvania, talk, talk about what the, what, what, about not the votes and the three not, days Pennsylvania later. will not change from whatever the Secretary of State sends off to the Electoral College. It is over. It's been contested at the moment, is it not? Well, if you call Rudy Giuliani's appearance as part of a contest, I suppose you'd, you'd have that. But how many uh, of the lawsuits that Trump has filed uh, have been rejected in the courts? Well, well, I last saw 11, but it's probably more than that. Majority of them thus far, but the big one is Pennsylvania, is it not? Well, it could be. In terms of the the claim, I cannot see it being upheld. Do you want to talk about the, that claim? Way, Isn't the claim about... By, by the way, no, the I don't, the, because, why, why because of this fact, this, uh, this reality. The US courts, right up to the Supreme Court, are not going to intervene in an election where there's a five million person gap. They will not do it. The most capable politician in the United States at the moment is probably the Chief Justice, John Roberts. He's demonstrated that time and time again. Given that, the American courts are not going to intervene on this. When does the vote count, Stephen? Three days after it gets served in? When no, it counts when it's, the... collected, when it's collected 
uh, in accordance so the with the law the, the when it's registered. Law, and that's what isn't the Pennsylvania law in Pennsylvania say that it's only based on by the time the polls close on the day of the election, they're counted. Is there not already a larger number of votes been set aside? Which, votes which have been set aside, afterwards. but you've got, to, you've got to be realistic here mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. in terms of the impact of COVID. Mm. I mean, I, I know Sean Hannity says, well, just toss Pennsylvania uh, aside. Yep. What court is going to do that? Tell me that. You may well go to the Supreme Court. No. You don't think it'll go to the Supreme Court? The circumstances are the trumpeteers mm. are clutching at straws uh, here and relying upon a triumph of hope over experience. It's not going to happen. Okay, let me ask you this. So you you are comfortable with the way that the the votes have been counted? Entirely I, comfortable, over, indeed. Over indeed. I'm, I'm please. Listen, I'm not I'm not talking from a Trump point of view. I'm talking from actually just running an election. It just seems to be absolutely B grade how things have been done. Well, they, still, well, they still haven't finished counting in a number that, of states, that's, Stephen. That's that's another argument. That's an argument for the Americans reforming their electoral system. So therefore, doesn't it not concern you in regards to the argument for democracy? If you're going to go for a vote, you want to make sure that your votes are counted I and would that be, there is consistency? I would be pleased if the Americans had our electoral commission running their polls yep. and they had mandatory voting. But neither is going to happen in the short term, so you work with what you have. As Theodore Roosevelt was fond of saying, and you probably heard me say it, you work with what you have, when you have it, where you have it. I think, I think you've got a battle on the state. Pennsylvania. I think it might be interesting. I don't think he's necessarily going to win, but he's going to fight that one very hard. That's that's his only route, correct? If, well, he, win, if he wins Pennsylvania, think, then he may have I some hope. If he doesn't win Pennsylvania, I don't think that argument. route exists. I don't think it. I don't think it's there. Mm. I don't think it's there. Okay. All right. What about the uh, the computers? Is this the allegation that it was a Serb server that changed the result of the election? Not not sure it's Serb. That there, was there, the, that was no, the it latest. Came out, it came out of Venezuela, wasn't it? Venezuela. Sorry, I'm not across that one. You haven't heard that one? No, I don't believe it. <laughs> no, I'm, ple I'm pleased to be able to dismiss it. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll bring that up in a second for you. So or, what, the Maduro government actually changed the result of the election. Is that the allegation? Yeah, you, so you have read it. You, you know where I'm coming from. No, no, you can just construct conspiracy theories quite easily when it comes to the American hard right and alt right. And they're Australian uh, acolytes. All right. So let's talk about so what actually happened. So what other points do you think were contributory to the swing to Biden? Because at the end of the day, it's not it's not an enormous difference really, is there? So it's almost 50-50. No, but flipping states like Georgia is uh, an enormous difference. Flipping Arizona is an enormous difference. Taking Texas to the wire is an enormous difference. So you have a circumstance in which, unlike 2016, yep. where Donald Trump could portray Hillary Clinton as, uh, as being something that was manifestly evil, apparently. I obviously don't share that view, quite the contrary, but uh, crooked Hillary and all this sort of abuse didn't work with Joe Biden, which is why the Republicans had to switch to Hunter Biden, who was not on the ballot paper. Circumstances of Americans' estimation of the former vice president, now the president-elect, is that he was likable. Over 60% of Americans, when the polls were, uh, uh, were convened, said they liked him. They found him likable. And that worked to his advantage. It also worked to his advantage that the Biden campaign decided they'd be very disciplined on COVID, which meant rallies in cars and so on and so forth where you honked your horn instead of being uh, up there in those mass spreading uh, events that the Trump campaign had. People watch those things. People watch those things. They observe closely. So Joe Biden in the basement, then coming out for limited appearances and so on, Worked. There's no doubt about that. Kamala Harris, very disciplined. Both the principal Democrats, very measured. Barack Obama, no question an advantage, a real asset. I loved Obama you really, you, in you, you Detroit. You really think that, do you? I wouldn't have said it unless I did. Well, the reason Trump got in was because of but his I'm failures, not, but anyway. I'm not, I'm not Donald Trump here. I'm not making it up as I go along. Circumstances being what they were in Detroit when he walked out and a woman in the crowd called out, we missed you. And he said, well, I missed you. That's why I'm back. And I thought, that is really a classy politician. 
doesn't expect that, but bang, he's got to reply and suddenly people are honking and, and they're away. So you've got real campaign focus, real discipline, really measured. Now, I saw Joe Biden out in Iowa during the primary. Yes. A little town called Waukee in a, a school gymnasium. I thought he was a bit rusty at the time. I wrote that at the time. But he improved and he kept improving in the sense that he has a stutter, which he's had since childhood. And to deal with that, he stops, waits, and then proceeds again. And it's a successful formula. And to that end, he kept the focus on the Trump administration, particularly on COVID, because when you have a ballot for a president seeking a second term, it's always a referendum, always a referendum on the administration. Sure. So you had COVID, you had the economy and so on and so forth. You had issues such as uh, climate change policy, broader relations with the allies, things of that nature. And of course, all the racial tension that it's spilled over in the US the last several months after the tragedy of George Floyd's killing and, and, and obviously other episodes such as Louisville and uh, and the like. So the Biden campaign was, was focused from the time that he won South Carolina and then Super Tuesday, he never lost sight of the prize. As Dr. King would say, the eyes on, were on the prize. How much money was actually spent to support the, uh, the Biden campaign, you think? Total of about $15 billion on the election. Unbelievable, isn't it? How much of that came $15 billion. from the Democratic uh, Party remains to be seen. The Democrats comfortably outspent Republicans. It's yeah. unusual. This is why Lindsey Graham, a senator re-elected in South Carolina, went on Fox News to ask for money that he was being outspent by his opponent. That's unheard of. That's right. And I think that area was the highest spend, wasn't it? $57 million raised in one quarter for the Democratic candidate. That being the case, yes, there was quite a lot of big tech money, quite a lot of Wall Street money, but a lot of ordinary people put their hands in their pockets. What? By the way, I'm fascinated by the new Trump political action committee. Go on. The one that is supposedly <laughs> raising money for the legal case. Mm -hmm. But if you read the fine print... It would seem it's focused more on the Donald's future than on the past. Well, he might be uh, becoming a TV star, set his own TV station up. Well, that's why I he's attacking he's, Fox News. Well, I don't think he's going to go Fox. I think he's going to break no, away that, and that go is, to a whole new But um, that's TV why station. he's attacking Fox News, to carve out the ground. And he was stunned when Arnon Mishkin, who's the best caller of election statistics in the United States, who runs the Fox News decision desk, called Arizona very early, and he got it right for Biden. And the problem for the Republicans was AP had linked its coverage to Fox. They did. So as soon as yeah. that happened, bang, that went around the world. Yep. Bang. And the uh, the Trump narrative was shattered very early on. Why are we calling him president-elect? Because he is. According to who? Hasn't according, been, hasn't, according you're a lawyer. He, hasn't according been to, he has not been certified. According to all the counts to date, yep. Joe Biden has 306 electoral college votes. And Donald Trump has 232. Now, the curious thing about that is that's the exact reversal of 2016. It is. And how did Trump dis uh, decide to describe that? I don't know. As a landslide. Trump <laughs> decided that that was a landslide. And he called it very early, mm -hmm. like within a day, <laughs> day or so. Reverse it now. And of course, it's got to be challenged everywhere. All right. The the numbers will hold up, believe me. For the people what do you listening, think, what do you, think you, may, really be, going to come you may be certain that Joe Biden is the 46th president of the United States. Okay. How I like to deal in certainties. So do I. That's so, no, so do I. That's why, that's why I want the proper votes counted. That's what worries me so well, much. Well, that's what's happened. No, no, it hasn't. They're doing, are they, doing, are they not doing happened. recounts? Here and there, there are recounts, which won't alter things. Well, where in the history of American presidential counts has a recount ever altered anything? The argument in Florida mm -hmm. was about which votes you count and which votes you recount. That's what the, the punching Fl polls. Florida Supreme, the Chads, yep. Florida Supreme Court said a, a, a full recount. The U.S. Supreme Court said no. That was the difference. But what did Al Gore do? He conceded. Joe Lieberman, his running mate, Senator Joe Lieberman from Connecticut, wanted to box on. And the former vice president, to his great credit, said no. Okay, I'm not going to put the country through this. And he conceded, okay. which is what should happen now. So there can be a transition, which is in the interest not only of the United States, but of all its allies. 
Yeah, and I, I concur with you, Stephen. I think that um, Trump shall allow Biden to attend intel briefings, etc. A lot more than that. Public health is the the pressing domestic uh, uh, issue. The international issues are where adversaries can seek advantage. And I think at the moment, there is need for the vice president, now president-elect Biden, to be thoroughly briefed and letting people know in the administration what his policies happen to be. And that includes current Trump cabinet ministers. Yeah, okay. I agree with that. How did the polls get it so horribly wrong? They've done it now. They've done it now twice, and they got it wrong even in Australia last time. They were a little, a little bit better this time, but not by much. No the circumstances were they uh, simply did not register the increasing vote for Donald Trump, which often is amongst um, working class uh, people. Uh, they tend to be underrepresented in the polls, and I think there was a fair amount of fatigue on the part of Americans taking calls from polls, those that were, mm -hmm. and they would simply want the pollster to go away. So I suspect that there was the, uh, the factor of uh, underrepresentation, the factor of exhaustion, and there's always just a little bit of herd mentality amongst the pollsters. We saw it in 2016. We saw it again. In 2016, the LA Times got it right, but everyone argued that it was an outlier. It wasn't. They were accurate. This time, I can't think of anyone who are polled as accurately as you would want in an election of this significance. Yeah, because ultimately, didn't President Trump win the most votes for any president in US history? Well, he's polled the most votes for a candidate for the presidency, except for one other person yeah, who beat him. But I'm just saying that's how wrong the, uh, the pollsters were, weren't they? Yes, they were wrong. They're a little bit more accurate than 2016. That's all you can say. And, you know, and yet, do you have a view of the suppressing of votes as a result of the pollsters getting so wrong? Does that suppression, actually come, suppression does that come into votes, play at all? And, and like, suppression and of votes. Sides, but suppression of votes is the way elections are actually stolen in the United States. Now, there's a governor of Georgia named Kemp, who was the Secretary of State, who was opposed by a uh, very, very capable. African American woman by the name of Stacey Abrams. Now, what the Republicans in Georgia did was to purge the rolls and artificially deflate the Democratic vote 2018. So Kemp, who was the Secretary of State presiding over the poll while he was the primary candidate in same poll, Kemp wins by about 50,000 over Abrams. The Democrats then turned around and enrolled figure that I've seen is 800,000 more Georgians. And that told, in terms of the state of Georgia, the overall uh, a result that has been uh, tallied and will be confirmed. Circumstances being what they are, you see purging of the rolls and other devices as the way to steal elections in a voluntary voting system. What about the harvesting of votes? Did you hear much about that? No, I didn't. Not really. You didn't hear much about that at all? Not really, no. Okay. All right. You're about to enlighten me on the CMA. <laughs> I'm just surprised you didn't. You know, I'm just look. I mean, some, 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 look for for the for uh, the listeners. People queued for eight, ten, twelve hours to vote. Yeah, and that's outrageous. They it? It, it it is absurd and, and it's it not is, compulsory and it is wrong. But people did that because they wanted to register their vote. Now, in my experience, people don't queue for ten to twelve hours to vote for someone. They do it to vote against someone. And that was registered in a lot of places, Philadelphia being the classic uh, example. Detroit uh, is another. And then what happened in the House and what happened in the Senate? Ah, that, that's, they're now interesting that's, questions. Well, I, I well think they are, aren't they? I, I think they're fascinating. I, I said in my opening remarks, and I, I don't fear contradiction here, Americans were very committed. We saw that. They were very deliberate. Happy to vote for Joe Biden at the top of the ballot paper. Not so happy about voting for some other uh, uh, candidates a bit further down. Now, where the candidate was particularly strong, mm -hmm. I'm thinking Susan Collins, the Republican senator for, uh, for Maine, she was supposedly under threat. She won comfortably. I'm thinking of Mark Kelly, the astronaut and, and husband of Gabby Giffords out in uh, Arizona. I'm thinking of John Hickenlooper, the former governor of Colorado, they won. Uh, strong campaigns are strong candidates, and people acknowledge that. 
a lot of others fell by the wayside, despite massive amounts of money in some cases. So they were very deliberate votes. Mm -hmm. So it's likely the Republicans will have a majority, a narrow majority, but a majority in the, the Senate. 52, 48, you reckon? Something like that, it's depending upon the runoffs in Georgia on the 5th of January in Georgia. Yeah. Um, it's possible for the Democrats to win both. I think it's more likely the Republicans yeah. win both. In the House, where some of the uh, Democratic uh, left had been uh, out campaigning on defund the police and socialist agendas and things of this nature, Medicare for all, that told against the Democrats told against the Democrats. So they probably uh, dropped somewhere between eight and 11 seats. Nancy Pelosi will have a narrow majority. Now, what does it mean? I actually think it works for the new president, strengthens his hand because his party's not in a situation to dictate to him. Will not happen. If Mitch McConnell wants to be bracketed with Lyndon Johnson as majority leader, as he's indicated he does, then he will have to have the kind of relationship with President Biden that LBJ had with President Eisenhower. That's the only way to do it. If the Republicans wish to be obstructive, they can. If the Democrats wish to be adventurous, they can. But I suspect the Biden administration will tack to the centre and look to pick up some uh, solid support from the Democratic Party and from a more uh, reasonable Republican Party. Now, here's the catch. Donald Trump is not going to go away. Okay, we shouldn't think he's been defeated. Bye-bye, Donnie. Circumstances will be that he will be out there, I suspect replacing Rush Limbaugh as being the media spokesman for the Republican right. Okay. Mainly for, for alt-right, but the Republican right. Yep. He will be a media player, be how he earns his money, and he'll need money. And he will need money. Perhaps as a, as a uh, competitor uh, with Fox, that will be an interesting fight. Mm, I think so. Very interesting yep. fight. Perhaps possibly over time as a contributor to Fox, but I think the former is more likely than the, uh, than the latter. Now, Trump and his family wish to hold control of the Republican Party, which has become a cult grouped around Donald Trump Sr., that being the case, they're looking at two years down the track at midterms. Yes, exactly. They're looking at whether or not Donald Trump Sr. can uh, uh, return to the White House in four years' time, like President Cleveland did at the end of the 19th century. Only one president's ever done that. Uh, it's possible. But to do that, of course, brings an almighty battle within the Republican Party itself. Because you have Mike Pompeo has, has ambitions. Yep. Nikki Haley, the former UN ambassador, uh, is is very capable of Senator Marco Rubio from Florida. Ted Cruz. Another one has Ted Cruz has aspirations too. Hmm. Uh, and, and there are others. And there are others. So I suspect, and it'll be interesting to see how this maps out over the next year or two, Donald Trump in exile from the White House is more of a problem for the Republicans, particularly for Mitch McConnell, than for the new president. Did I really vote for Biden at the end of the day? How many times did he appear? Uh, he was massively supported by the media, as you said, an enormous amount in billions and billions. Or was I just actually voting out Trump? Because well, like, the, like, you're, 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 the you're, as you said, what did you say last time? You're a yellow dog Democrat. Yes. Okay, which means you must have liked Mr. Kennedy and other people who gave inspiration. Does Mr. Biden and Kamala Harris give you the inspiration to reflect 77 million people? I'll tell you what inspires me about uh, Joe Biden, that he was nearly knocked out of the contest in Iowa and should have been knocked out of the contest in New Hampshire. He goes on to South Carolina, where Representative Jim Clyburn endorses him, and much of the African-American uh, vote, particularly of the middle-aged and uh, seniors, backed him in. Young people, not so impressed. But he wins South Carolina, and off that springboard, he sweeps Super Tuesday. Mm. He wins states where his campaign hasn't spent a dollar. Now, that happened for a reason, because the Democratic Party at rank-and-file base level wanted a candidate who could beat Donald Trump. And they didn't see any of the other contenders. And there were some good ones. I, I like uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, for example. 
Mayor Pete. But they didn't think a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren or others could do it. So they came back to the former vice president, whom they knew. So he then surfs that through a successful uh, virtual convention. He has a platform, which the Republicans didn't have. And I find that astonishing. The Republican Party went to a general election without a platform. Do you think Biden actually sold his platform? I think he did oh. because he held... Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just, think, I think. just don't do a Trump in, in a debate <laughs> on me. You know, this is not the first debate again. <laughs> so I was about to ask you that in a second. Circumstances being uh, what they were, even the most fervid trumpeteer has to acknowledge that Biden held the Democratic coalition together. Hillary Clinton could not. Hillary, unfortunately, Mrs. Clinton, whom I admire, uh, lost tr uh, votes to Trump, uh, Bernie Sanders camp and so on and so forth in the Midwest, the upper Midwest. That uh, cost her the, uh, the election amongst uh, other things. Mm -hmm. The constituency that's grouped under the Democratic Party banner held together. Biden did not have to concede Medicare for all. He did not have to uh, concede on everything on the Green New Deal for AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Not, not yet. And so on. Yep. But last time, people were saying he, he would concede it going to the election, yeah, but, he, the, did, but the, he didn't. People also said Trump would go send us all to war. He's the first US president never taken the country to war. Oh, and know. he's doing so well with troop withdrawals now. Did he take us to war? He is doing so well. Let's, let's not talk uh, about no, no, hypotheticals I've here. I've interrupted you. Come I on. said, no, no, no. I, I prefer to deal in realities. Yeah. Okay. Gravity. Are we, uh, you know, we, gravity. Have, we gone, have we gone into a conflict under President Trump? No. Has every other president for the Are last we, number of years gone uh, into conflict? Since Jimmy Carter, yes. She whiz. We got, everyone got that wrong. So are we arguing he ran a successful foreign policy now? I thought he's done pretty good in the Middle East. You don't, think he's, middle, doing, you don't in, think he's doing well there? In the Middle East, I give him marks. Very good marks. I don't give him marks for uh, relations with the European allies, uh, for example. I don't give him marks for relations with the Canadians or the Koreans and others. I don't give him marks for essentially running a chaotic White House. But at any rate, you distracted me here. Biden held the coalition together. Yeah, it's yeah. important to have a no, focus. Yeah, important enough. to have a focus. I mean, yep. you can't just sit in your in your bedroom and watch Fox TV all day the way some other people do. No, I balance it with the, CNN. <laughs> so does the former president or the outgoing president. Apparently, even watches MS, MSNBC. Well, he might even buy so the coalition, the coalition of the Democratic Party is held together. He makes a very good choice in Kamala Harris, who undoubtedly brought something to the ticket and undoubtedly helped uh, in, in all kinds of ways, particularly in, in terms of uh, turnout. So the Democrats win. So I give him marks for running a very focused, very disciplined, very measured campaign. Okay. A superior campaign to the, uh, the business of these uh, super well, spreader when events. Got, when you've got 90% of the media against you, you're up, for it, you're up for it. Don't you agree? Well, some people say it was 100%, including Fox News was against him. I'd wonder oh, I don't, but... Well, look, let's, you've, you've well, got let's a, think you've about got it. A, look, let's think about it. Every, when, when, when Hillary, who you've you got admire... You've got to be fair income, When Hillary, yeah. who you admire, lost, okay? Day one, the Democrats have sought out to bring him down. And that's fair enough. That's politics. For everything from it's also American history. All right, so they've gone out of their way, and then the, you know everything from Flynn through to the impeachment, right? All have pretty much failed. Okay, but he's been fighting tooth and nail all the way through. Well, there are a few of, a few of his senior advisors have been in jail or are still in jail. You can't deny that. What they Come weren't. On. They were, and they've been released as well, have they not? Thanks to COVID, yes. Yeah, and have, and have the has the head of the FBI been fired? Has the number two, Mr. Cabe, been fired? Are we waiting for a major report to come from AG Barr and the corruption under the Obama camp to come out? Or is that going to be suppressed? Well, who would suppress it? Maybe Mr. Barr. I don't, I don't know. I, I doubt you it. You wouldn't think so? I you reckon, you reckon Mr. Barr is going to release it? I doubt that too. I don't think there's any – the report to which you allude, yep. I thought had been scratched because there was nothing to it. Durham report? No. No, not that one. They're no, not. no, that's the one Another one that next. Trump, that Trump uh, demanded, I, I think that'll be scratched. Well, I'm not sure. Anyway. I think it has been scratched anyway. So, so if – and as you said rightly in our last podcast, you did predict Mr. Biden. What are we going to have in the sense of presidency? One fellow guest – 
that we had not that long ago used the words here, probably relatively benign. What do you think Mr. Biden's going to deliver to the I th- world? I think, he's, I, I think he's got some serious challenges, obviously, COVID being the, uh, the biggest one. And I think so far he's handled it well in terms of what he's able to do, despite the obstructionism of the current uh, uh, president, which is, is really criminal in terms of what's happening in America at the moment with people dying. In the th- in thousands. Yeah, didn't you say criminal. earlier, Stephen, the states manage it, don't they not? The, the national government yep. sets the tone, sets the direction, Fair point. sets the framework. And it's, as Theodore Roosevelt was fond of saying, there is a bully pulpit in the White House and the president should use it. Very important. Now, what, what do we expect beyond that? An, uh, an easing of economic circumstances and recovery, a rebuilding of relations with allies, which is no doubt Joe Biden can achieve. He heard a collective sigh of relief from Europe when uh, uh, when when Donald Trump was obviously being beaten uh, in, in the uh, in the general election. But I think something more. And Trumpeteers are fond of saying this: "Oh well, I don't hold with the tweeting or the abuse or the mocking of the disabled and so on, or the sexism. I don't hold with any of that." But he's done a good job. That's like saying it's not Richard Nixon on the tapes. The real Donald Trump is the tweet. The real Richard Nixon was on the Oval Office tapes. And so a lot of Americans were really fed up with that to the back teeth and voted accordingly. Now, I think one of the important things that Joe Biden has to do is to um, restore dignity and civility to the Oval Office and center it again center it as a, uh, as a fulcrum for, uh, for public discussion, public debate, and also leadership with a moral compass. Yeah, but that's the big question. Is he going to be able to I center think it? He is. You've, got, you've got AOC pushing. You've got Bernie Sanders who pushing wants to be where? the green energy so, focus, and, right? And, is, and the, is, votes, is the votes she has? Does she have enough votes in the Democratic caucus today? I don't think today? so, but I don't, I, I don't so. know. He's, he is, does persuad- she have he's the, persuadable, is Does he she have the speaker's support? No. No. But does she have a lot of... And Bernie the, Sanders wants to be Secretary of Labor? Yeah. Well, that'd be interesting. Yeah, it would be very interesting. Borderline communist. No. Uh, you don't think so? I, well, I always liked Lindsey Graham's remark. You know, the problem with Bernie is he went off to honeymoon in the Soviet Union and never came back. I kind of like Bernie. I don't think he's crazy. He's, he, right. he's, got, he's got particular views. Can they work in an administration in the Labor portfolio or another? Well, that remains to be seen. All right, and Elizabeth Warren, well, where's where she going to finish up? Because she's, well, she's, she's already pushing the progressive no, economic platform, which is a Before we hit the hysteria button here. No, no, it's not. Isn't the governor of Massachusetts currently a Republican? Or am I wrong? I'll stand correction here. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, if Elizabeth Warren goes into the uh, administration, she vacates a Senate seat and a Republican governor will send a Republican. Oh, okay. QED. It's good to deal in realities. So you can still be influential. Oh, no doubt about that. Mm. But if you have to get things through the United States Senate, which is possessed of a narrow Republican majority, and a House of Representatives, which is possessed of a narrow Democratic majority, I say again, it's a matter of tacking to the centre. Do you think Biden and his team, because AAC has sort of come out of some comments recently, going to be seeking some form of retribution? Upon whom? Trump. And those who... Oh, I, I well, saw uh, that. AOC said it, right? So I saw that's, that. And that is facts, right? As you say. I saw that, but I don't think it goes very far, and it should not go very far. Agreed. If we start down that path, we're in a bad and I think that, I think that the new uh, president would frown on that, frankly. This notion of... They, what do they call it? Accountability. But it's actually retribution or revenge. No. That's wrong. It shouldn't go anywhere. All right. So what else besides Biden being a really nice guy, bringing stability into the House... What else is he going to do? What does he stand for on international markets? What does he stand for on the economy? He's going to be raising tax. He's going to be... Um, well, I'm not sure about raising tax. You I mean, don't that's, think so? a, that's asserted. Well, is a Republican Senate going to agree to that? They've, that's no, the question no, now. That thing, and that's why people are rejoicing the fact that, thank God, there's Republicans well, in the Senate. If there's not, then the we're mix, in big trouble, the mix, aren't we? The mix of taxes may change in terms of where the weight falls, but raising taxes on ordinary Americans overall, I doubt that. Doubt that very much. And do you think there is going to be much dirt coming out with regards to Hunter and the deal was done, the relationships with, and if there were kickbacks, et cetera, do you think that's going to actually affect him? So uh, 
Uh, Donald Trump is relying on Rudy Giuliani for this or what? No, there's more than Giuliani, as you know. I doubt anything of substance comes out. I mean, I think it's important to note Hunter Biden was not on the ballot paper and he's not in the administration. And unless it can be linked well, who, directly well, to, an act, you know? got the big to an act of corruption by the president-elect, there is no story. And that's what most American media have said, as well as the fact they cannot validate the so-called hard drive. They can't validate the hard drive. No, that's why they wouldn't touch no, the, the story. The, the, the FBI start, did not know. The FBI's opened the case, are they not? Yes or no? I have read that there was an FBI inquiry. I don't know if there's any case. That's different to opening an inquiry. Okay. And you're confident... I don't want to speak as a lawyer, but I just did. No, you did? Okay. It's, is, the, is the left going to work with the Republicans? Doubt that. Mm. Uh, I suspect this will be another form of triangulation, which was something that the Clinton administration tried courtesy of some advice from a subsequently disgraced pollster named Dick Morris. And triangulation involved the administration taking a position that was somewhere between the Democrats in Congress and the Republicans in Congress. In other words, occupying the middle ground. And I suspect that's where President-elect Biden will wish to be. So in the potential, and the word is still a potential, Stephen, even though you see it differently, um, the election of Mr. Biden, is this a, um, a reflection on the move towards socialism? No. Why do you say that? Because there's no evidence to suggest that it is. There are some people in the Democratic Party, always have been people in the Democratic Party, describe themselves as social democrats or democratic socialists. Yeah. However, they've not been in a situation to command a majority in a primary to get up a presidential candidate in a very long time. And where there have been socialist candidates for president, like Eugene V. Debs, turn of the century, polled respectably, but nowhere near sufficient votes to uh, to win the uh, the presidency. And I think that remains the same. And there's a congresswoman by the name of Spanberger from memory from Virginia, a Democrat, who said she no longer wants the Democrats ever to utter the word socialism again, because it's so difficult for people contesting in uh, red seats and purple seats. And I think that will probably be the prevailing view inside the Democratic caucus in Washington. So, so Bernie, Elizabeth Warren and AOC aren't going to get a, a strong voice? Well, there'll be strong voices, but will they prevail? That's the question. I don't think so. What's going to happen with Nancy? Her, the performance wasn't great. Well, Speaker Pelosi has been written off many times. Uh, she's still there, and I suspect she will be a force, may well retain the speakership for another term. She's a formidable lady from a great Baltimore Democratic family, and she shows that all the time. And were you surprised by what the Republicans were able to succeed in regards to women getting voted? Because I think, I think uh, people misread that completely, and the support in the black vote. Uh, the Republicans did somewhat better amongst African Americans. They did uh, uh, somewhat better amongst American women, but part of the Democratic Party's strength in this election is to be found in the suburbs amongst women voters, and I'm not sure that that's going to change. And if we did not have mail-in votes? Well, more people would have voted on the day. So you don't think that would have changed the... Um... It's possible, possible, but I doubt it. I think... For, for this reason. And the very question, reason. wasn't it, that that whole process was very, it's not just vote because you can't make it, you're getting focused on to vote, were you not? Yeah, but a lot of American states have had mail-in voting for years and years. Yeah, but not in the, Successfully. But not, but not in the, not no, to give this attention, it, Stephen. It, that's true, right? It, it doesn't matter. Oh, come on, if you're getting targeted. It doesn't matter. No vulnerable people got signed up accidentally? Well, if they were signed up accidentally, it will emerge. And it hasn't to date. I mean, I can see a windmill over there, but I'm not going to tilt at it. Simple fact of the matter is, if there'd been no mail-in voting, a lot more people would have voted in the day. And as I say, people were committed. They were committed. And a lot of people were concerned about COVID, obviously, yeah, which is why yeah. they voted mail-in. And I do not like the kind of things that happened in Texas. Now, for Trumpeteers, this may be regarded as fair play. I don't think so. Greg Abbott, the governor, ruled there was going to be one drop-off place 
in every county. Okay, some counties had a couple of hundred. Yep. But Harris County, which is basically the city of Houston, has a couple of million. So one drop-off place? Crazy. That's the kind of thing that discredits the democratic system. Now, it was designed to suppress the vote for the Democrats. Designed to suppress the vote. I think these are the sorts of things, realistically, that should be looked at carefully and reformed once Rudy Giuliani has disappeared from the scene with his Four Seasons car park press conference, which has to be the most ludicrous event. <laughs> that was... Really. They went to the wrong Four Seasons Sandwich Sandwiched between a crematorium or something or a funeral home and a sex shop. I mean, really. Talk about low rent. What did you think of the uh, the timing of Pfizer? making that announcement, yet had all the information before the election and wouldn't come out and say they found something which is 90% good. Well, judge timing, wasn't it? Interesting, isn't it? Well, they didn't want to fix do it, a... Fix isn't in, eh? We, they did not... Well, bear in mind they have American and German stakeholders. Circumstances being what they may, no one wanted to be a James Comey again. So they let it go till after the election. What does it mean for Australia? I think there are opportunities in uh, in this. We've gotten on well with Joe Biden previously when he was in the Senate, when he was vice president. I went to a, uh, a private forum with him in the treaty room of the White House while he was vice president. He was excellent. He was very sharp. He was very personable. He dealt with all the, uh, uh, the questions and he was on very good terms with the Australians uh, in the room. He liked uh, Julie Bishop when she was foreign minister, for example. They got on particularly well. I think... Our Prime Minister has been astute, most astute, early phone call and inviting the President to come to Australia for the uh, anniversary of, uh, of ANZUS. So I think that has put us in good stead and we just try and make it a seamless translation. What are the Chinese thinking about, Stephen? Very difficult to, to read the Politburo in, uh, in Beijing. They probably see uh, Donald Trump's defeat as an opportunity to test the new administration, test the new administration in terms of security, in terms of trade and the, uh, and the like. I don't see them altering uh, course, but I suspect the powers that be in Washington, right across the board in the Congress and in the administration and elsewhere, have pretty much agreed that China is well, at best, a strategic competitor, shall we say. Yes. So you've got from the left of the Democratic Party, and some Republicans are active on this too, to be fair to them, on the treatment of the Uyghurs, on the suppression of human rights, yes. right through theft of uh, intellectual property, yep. the massive hacking that goes on yep. into US institutions, right through uh, to the military uh, exercise in the South China Sea, the militarization of the islands and the like, on which a number of Republicans are focused and more than a few Democrats, you really have got a convergence of views that uh, China is not a friendly actor and has to be opposed when it is clear that their uh, purposes are malign. So I don't think that's going to change. And I don't think the president-elect will want to change it, actually. The language will be different. The language out of the White House will be different. I don't think you'll hear President-elect Biden refer to COVID-19 as the Chinese flu, for example. I don't think he'll do that. But I think it'll be quite a robust policy with respect to, uh, to China and Chinese ambitions in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere. Do you think Mr. Biden and his team are going to do well from all the work that Mr. Trump has done, particularly around the economy? In terms of uh, maintaining... Uh, some of the changes that the Trump administration uh, brought in, yes, but I think there'll be some executive orders that reverse some of the Trump determinations, and that that is is usual in any circumstance. And I think there'll be a much greater emphasis economically on uh, issues like living wages for Americans. So you don't have a circumstance in which the minimum wage is really not a wage on which people can uh, can raise a family. Yeah, but they didn't do anything about it last time. But I think they will this time. That's what I'm saying. I listened to Vice President-elect uh, Harris the other night talking about new jobs, new union jobs. Well, that's well beyond the minimum wage. What's the strategy for the Democrats 
in regards to the presidency, is there more in that Biden really is only good for one term? Look, what, what do you really think would be, you know, how old is the gentleman? He's going to be the oldest ever president by some way, correct? Yes. And there's, he's already got questions around. Well, that is quite a remarkable achievement. No one gives him credit for that. Was he 77 now? He'll be 78, 78. When, his turn, when, his, yeah. when his term begins. So it may well be that he's a one-term uh, uh, president, that he sets his sights on particular goals and looks to achieve them and, uh, and then retires, perhaps. But... He's really shattered another glass ceiling here for seniors in terms of active if life he, well he, into the end of uh, your uh, your eighth decade. If he performs. Well, that's true of any president. What do you think? Well, what do you think of his cognitive ability? I don't have any doubt about it. You really don't? Well, I just said that. I don't have any doubt about it. Okay. All right. That's... Well, I say again, people mistake the fact we all know he that he deals, he, deals, he deals with a stutter yes. now. That doesn't mean you get things completely exactly wrong. You way. don't know which town you're in. You don't know your child's name. You don't know your wife's name, whatever sometimes, Stephen. President more Reagan than once. once raised his glass in a state function in Brasilia and congratulated the people of Bolivia. I mean, let's be realistic here. People make mistakes. All right. He once turned around at a function is President Reagan, and address one of his cabinet ministers, it's good to see you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, leave us not, again, hit the hysteria button. Yeah, but he did have cognitive issues want, at the end. I just want to see a certain calm descend in America. And that's what it is, isn't it? A calm. Uh, is ultimately, that's why he got in, you think? Ultimately, it's when part it, of it. It's when it really comes it. to the crunch, what, is that, that's the key, to, key factor, you reckon? It's part of it. It's part of it. So ultimately, it was Trump's to lose. It always was, yes. It always was. You're nodding sagely here, but I can't. No, read no, your, I, I know. And he's, he's, and he's put himself in that situation, didn't well, he? Well, look, let's just let's just focus for a moment on it's Trumps to lose, okay? How smart is it to trash the McCain family, given the fact that you need Arizona in your column? Couldn't understand it. It is just sheer lunacy. How sensible is it? to trash the city of Philadelphia in one of the debates when you need Philadelphia to poll better for Republicans. You need the suburbs of Philadelphia. True. It doesn't make any sense at all. And I, I, I find it difficult to follow. And you have a circumstance in which not only the physics of American politics were overturned by Donald Trump in 2016, but the psychology of it. And it's not that the Republicans didn't have warning of this happening in the sense of what happened in the 2018 midterms with the turnout. There was an American electorate that wanted to register its view, and it wasn't well disposed to Donald Trump even at that time. So you really needed, if you were in the Republican Party, Republican Party leadership, to take stock of that and come back and do better, particularly amongst independents. So if I was sitting in the US over the last couple of months, how much am I getting inundated by the press during this period? Oh, you're overwhelmed. I mean, I'm on the Democratic Party's mailing list. I get five or six emails a day still from them. So where did, you're, over, if, you're overwhelmed. You, you can't and we, go and, outside without uh, seeing signs on the front uh, lawns and, and billboards and everything, radio, television, social media and the, the like. And were you concerned? And incidentally, just a question. Was that you who sponsored the Trump 2020 Skywriting effort the other day, <laughs> Greg. I, th I thought of you. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Were you concerned again, as a man who supports democracy and freedom of speech? The arguments around censorship for the large tech firms. I'm uneasy about you that, know yes. whether he's got the you know he's got the right. I to am uneasy views. about the large tech firms and their ability to influence events. Full stop. So. Where do we see the world going then in the future of the, of the you know, of, of any election? Because it's a personal it's view, I think with some of the large tech firms they face the same uh, uh, challenges from a Congress in particular that is less than impressed by them as Standard Oil faced nineteen hundred, the turn of the twentieth century, and that crystallised under the administration of President Theodore Roosevelt, where he broke up the trusts. I suspect that's the direction in which we're going. Now, whether that will be you know, broken up on the basis of, of geography 
or form or function, whatever remains to be seen. It may never happen. But if you were looking at the future and looking at the trajectory, you'd have to think that a lot of people in the American political class and in government think that the big techs have too much power. And, and if you stand back just as, again as a, as a former politician and, and student of, of history, how many times did Biden actually come out to present his wares? When you're thinking about compared to all the previous elections you've been across, seen, followed, it was unbelievably small. It was limited, but um, I note that the president uh, post the election has now played four games of golf and issued 400 tweets. I mean, what's the statistic, statistical importance here? Biden was measured and focused, and it worked. It worked. Yeah, yeah no, I'm just simply asking, going forward, are we going to see a totally different way how one, one, I would one, hope, one, I, one I would hope conducts themselves? That, that the Bidens in the White House will be very different to the Trumps in the White House. That's my hope. So what's going to be the first 12 months for Biden? Well, the focus will be on COVID and the economy, rebuilding relations with allies. I'm sure they're the three touchstones and in terms of social policy, endeavouring to take the country into a more tolerant uh, a period and a tolerant perspective on race relations. Yeah, okay. And you said rebuild the relations, the international relations. Where are they really fractured? In Europe in the main. The, are they really uh, fractured? The relationship, or the relationship that troubled, that troubled uh, James Mattis most when he was Secretary of Defence mm -hmm. were Donald Trump's endless rants about the relationship with uh, the Republic of Korea because the Americans had a trade deficit with Korea. And you would endlessly demand to know why the 8th Army was still in Korea, what are they doing, why are we there, we should rip up the security treaty and so on. And in the end, Mattis would say in these meetings that we're preserving the peace, that's why we're in Korea. Yeah, right. Now that's very troubling. I don't think we're going to see that from a, a Biden. The Taiwanese were at some risk of a second Trump administration. John Bolton made that very clear in his book. He thought that Taiwan was the ally most likely to be abandoned by Donald Trump. And you think about possibility of a trade deal with the Chinese, what uh, Donald Trump may or may not have been prepared to give away. You look at the Taiwan Straits. So I, know I took that aboard when I uh, read that by John Bolton and listened to him on a webinar not so long back. So I think you're going yeah, to but see he was also more strong. Orderly, some, he was also going, let's go and attack orderly. Iran as well, wasn't he? Well, he asked about it, but nothing happened. So that was pretty frightening. Well, uh, not in your estimation, because Trump never wanted to go to war. That's, that's he was just, he's just and asking that's, and about And that's why he sacked Iran. Bolton, is he not? Because Bolton was talking that up, was he no, not? No, I don't think so at all. Okay. So, 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 Trump tends to sack cabinet ministers and other senior advisors who actually disagree with him and stand up uh, to him, or people like the DNI, Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates, who achieves a profile and becomes a celebrity. Trump denounced him as a celebrity. Can you believe that? No, but anyway, I'm just, let's focus back on where so you're you don't believe that. No, I'm just going back to international relations and you're talking I suspect, Bolton, I suspect that the Europeans will want to rebuild the relationship. There'll still be pressure from the U.S., the Europeans to do more in their own defence, and it should happen. But I don't expect uh, President uh, Biden to question the uh, the value of Article 5 of the NATO Treaty the way Donald Trump did repeatedly. So what's Biden going to do regarding the nuclear program with the Iranians? Well, I suspect he would like to see the nuclear deal with modifications embraced again. I don't know with these new sanctions that Trump is putting in place with the Iranians if that's possible. And that, that's the question. Well, it, with, in the last it's a big one. couple of weeks, yeah, but in the last couple of weeks, Trump is endeavouring, the announcement in Afghanistan and Iraq is a classic case, Trump is endeavouring to uh, saddle the new president with more difficult strategic circumstances. That's the game. And I think that's wrong. Yeah, but hold on, let's, let's go back to, say, the Middle East for a second. Did Obama get that right? Well, Obama was no, come on. Well, Obama was elected. He had a deputy, didn't he? Obama was elected and re-elected president of the United States. Judgment was passed on him. We have moved on since then. Okay, and they didn't do a great job in Iran. Hotbed of every bit of terrorism activity in this world, sponsored out of that place. 
So what's Trump done with the Israelis, which has been pretty good, don't you think? And now you think like Biden, if Biden goes back in and does the deal with Iran, what happens to Israel and all those Arab states where they've just done this signing up? I've with? always discovered it's not wise to respond to hypotheticals. No, they're doing. Are they not signing treaties at the moment? The treaty with the Gulf states, the treaty with Sudan, is a step in the right direction. There's no question about that. The recognition of Israel, more can perhaps be achieved. Hmm. Having said that, I don't want to. Given the history of the Middle East, the last few thousand years, I don't want to speculate endlessly. I'm just concerned that Biden might go back to the old, the old ways, which would be a disaster for the Middle East. And well, the that's, not what the, that's not what the Europeans for, say. The, European well, the Europeans, allies, have the Europeans got it wrong? Europeans, uh, Europeans have a different view, so that's going to have to be negotiated. And that's going to be the change in Washington, and that allies will actually be consulted, I figure. And there will be a little bit of give and take here. Okay, interesting. Interesting perspective. What else should we take on You board? would have made a very good White House Chief of Staff for Donald Trump. Until he fired you. <laughs> Probably right. Probably right. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm a bit worried about Mr. Biden. And if you look at his track record, he hasn't done anything in 47 years to stand out as a strong leader, even within his own party. But he hung in there and he won, right? And he won the right to be president. And now he's coming into president. And we've got stormy days ahead. You've got the Russians. You've got the Iranians. The Middle East is a hotbed. You've got Israelis worried. We've got North Korea and we've got China. Deal and realities here again. He hasn't yet announced his team. He's announced nope. the chief of staff and a couple of other senior appointments yep. that were anticipated. Now, that, that was his but, the chief, cabinet, was but the cabinet is not yet uh, taken form. And I'm hoping that it won't only be senior Democrats, there will be some senior Republicans and independents in positions of responsibility. And that is likely to occur. It did not occur under the previous president. Role of vice president. Is Kamala going to be any different to Mr. Pence in the way that she conducts herself or the, the vice presidency role? Well, Mike Pence uh, was a loyal uh, deputy who kept his counsel publicly and did not create difficulties for the administration. Uh, I think Kamala Harris will do more than that in terms of uh, uh, pushing the boat out on race relations, uh, for example, on issues particularly important to, to American uh, uh, women, particularly in the COVID situation. And I think she will be a real asset to uh, President Biden. Stephen, if we're having this conversation in four years' time, which I, I really hope we do, who do you think, if he is given the presidency, Mr. Biden is going to be running up against? No one is given the presidency of the United States. He's won the presidency, and President Biden will, uh, in all likelihood, see across on the other side of the aisle uh, something of a... Um, heated contest involving senior Republicans from the Congress and elsewhere, and Donald J. Trump Sr. If that's not the case, then perhaps one of the, the younger members of the family, Donald Trump Jr. I know in, uh, in, in one classic uh, novel, Christopher Buckley's Make Russia Great Again, Donald Trump announces that the next Republican ticket will be Javanka. That'll be his son-in-law and his daughter will comprise the president and vice presidential ticket. So it's going to be interesting. Personally, looking ahead in American politics, I'm with Christopher Wray, the current head of the FBI. Ooh. When I was at Aspen uh, a year or two back, he was talking about being in Washington, D.C., and he decided to walk back to his office from a meeting. So he's walking along the street and a Middle-aged couple stopped him. They recognised him and said, Mr. Ray, uh, you know, introduced themselves. Pleasure to meet you. And they said, uh, just to let you know, sir, we're praying for you. And off they went. And the director said, well, I believe in the power of prayer myself, but I was wondering what had happened in the last two hours that people were needing to pray for me. And that's Washington, D.C., as it's been, where the former director of national intelligence, Dan Coates, used to wake himself up at 2 or 3 a.m. to read the presidential tweets until his wife said to him, well, that's not the job you have. 
actually. Now, all of that passes. Point I'm making is I don't particularly want to look four years ahead. I'd much rather look to January 20 and see how a Biden administration shakes out successfully, I trust. With all of what we've learned over this period of time, has the world lost faith in politics and the politicians? A lot of people have lost faith. There's no doubt about that. And not only politics and politicians, but the institutions, which is why I'm so very critical of the 45th president, who relentlessly trashed American institutions. On that, uh, Stephen, thank you very much for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to No Limitations. 